Napoleonic figure in Israel's history, with all that that implies. He's not someone that you see and you can stay indifferent about him. You, you have an opinion. You love him or you hate him. You're afraid of him or you want to be with him. He had so much political strength that he could do almost everything that he wanted. A brilliant battlefield soldier who consistently disobeyed orders. There was this tension which I never really resolved between uh, the charming, courteous, grandfatherly figure beloved by so many people in Israel and the brutal, savage, violent, often irrational uh, military commander who believed in savage retaliation against the Arabs. Sharon shunned dialogue, almost always preferring the iron fist. Sharon was a very intelligent man. Uh, he used bully tactics uh, to achieve his end, but his ends were always very cerebral and always very carefully worked out beforehand. He was known as the godfather of the settlements, but he finally withdrew settlers from Gaza. But the decision about the disengagement plan is the most difficult of all. He will be remembered as a man who reneged on his own ideology, the one who built the settlements and destroyed it. But a debilitating stroke cut his prime ministerial career short. Sharon was in a coma for years, leaving Israel to weigh up his legacy. He made it legitimate in the Israeli political life for settlements to be evacuated. He did more harm to the state of Israel than any Israeli state citizen I know until this very day. Born in 1928 to educated parents of Russian origin, Arik, as he was called, lived on a farm in a socialist cooperative, a moshav, at Kfar Malal, a village north of Tel Aviv in British-ruled Palestine. His childhood bred in him a love of the land that was never to leave him. His mother, like his father, was stubbornly independent, in the cooperative but not of it, a cut above their neighbours and fenced off from them. מיודעים שלהם, חברים מיוחדים, או מי שהם חשבו לנכון להכניס לחצר, לשער. זה גרם לכך שכל ההתייחסות הייתה שונה. His father was strict, teaching his son never to be a coward, and arming him with a dagger to help guard their orchard from Arabs. Arik was a lonely lad who enjoyed his schooling, but when it came to supporting classmates in a strike, he reflected the family spirit. He was uncompromising. We asked Eric, why don't you come with us to strike? We all are striking. We think that the, the teacher uh, did something that we didn't like. So he said his answer was very simple. I didn't come to strike in school. I came to learn in school. We were on strike for three days. And I didn't change his mind. No. We came back to the class, we got punished. Arik didn't get punished. No. Arab villages dotted the landscape. These were turbulent times, and as Sharon himself was later to write, life never seemed safe. These were the formative years of Ari El Sharon, fearing the Arabs, hating the Arabs, seeing the Arabs as the uh, natural and eternal enemy, quarreling with everybody around, sticking to his own beliefs, being absolutely certain that you are right and everybody else is wrong. 
At 17, Ariel Sharon joined the semi-underground Haganah, precursor to Israel's army. British rule in Palestine was in deep trouble. Israel declared independence in 1948. Her Arab neighbors attacked. Sharon was wounded and never again trusted generals in their bunkers. He remained a fighter and, under the wing of the legendary Moshe Dayan, he was by 1953, commanding Unit 101, an elite commando force designed to punish marauding Palestinian guerrillas. He gave us the feeling that we can do everything because he, he never said, listen, I'm not, I'm not sure that you can do it or something like this. We used to take many risks, really, not just in the battle, to cross mountain, to cross river, to do such things. The tiny village of Kibya on the Israel-Jordan border is in ruins as day survivors relate how troops struck across the frontier at night. They accuse Israeli forces of leveling buildings with grenades, shell fire and explosives, trapping entire families in the rubble. The attack prompts the United States, England and France to deliver their sharpest rebuke to Israel since its founding and to demand stern action to punish the guilty troops. Kibya, it was accident. It was an accident because no one thought, for sure not Arik, that something like this can happen. I was myself there uh, with the unit and I myself checked most of the buildings that were destroyed. And I can tell you that uh, I didn't see anybody there. It is clear that he got an order to kill as many people as possible. This was a written order he got. This must be remembered. It was not uh, something which he initiated. The order was to kill as many people as possible. Now he went there and he killed everybody. He just uh, blew up the houses with the people inside them. His legacy uh, will always be one of massacres, dating back to the 1950s even. The establishment of the notorious 101 unit the very painful Qibya massacre, massacre of children and, and women and, and tearing down homes, blowing up homes uh, on, on whole families. The death toll was 69 dead Palestinians, a retaliation for the murder of three Israelis. The world at large condemned the raid, but Israel's Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, seen here with Sharon, stood by his protege. Wamal. לא חשוב מה יגידו בעולם. לא חשוב מה יגידו על ישראל ב- בכל מקום אחר. מה שחשוב דבר אחד זה שאנחנו נוכל כאן להתקיים. ואם לא יהיה ברור שיש מחיר לחיי יהודים, לא נוכל פה להתקיים. וזה מה שקובע. Sharon then took over the army's paratroopers, but in the 1956 Suez campaign against Egypt, he disobeyed orders, dispatching a parachute unit to capture the Mittler Pass in Sinai at heavy cost to his troops. Criticized later by Ben-Gurion, he conceded, sometimes I make a mistake. Yael Dayan was a war reporter who became a Labour MP. She was attached to Sharon's division in 1967 and saw another side of the man. He was, he was very good with people. I suppose that's what impressed me. He was very calm, he did not uh, panic. or uh, he, he talked to the, to the drivers and the cooks and the machine gunner the same way that he would talk to the chief of staff or uh, to, to his superiors. He had a sense of humor bordering on the cynic, and um, it was a very good atmosphere. And um, he was in his element. The battlefield was his element. In the Six-Day War, age 38, a major general by now, Sharon showed his gift as a battlefield commander, knocking the enemy off balance. His Sinai battle plan is still taught as a model of its kind. Sharon in the course of time became a very good general, it has to be said. A general, a tactical general, rather than a strategic general. Uh, somebody resembling Patton, 
more than General Eisenhower. He knew each and every place in the battlefield. And I think that he had a kind of talent that when he was watching the map, it's my imagination, but I think that he saw the actual land, not the map, not the piece of paper, but he saw the hills, the dunes, the canals, everything. But despite his success on the battlefield, Sharon's private life was marked with tragedy. His son Gur died aged 10 whilst playing with an antique gun. Gur's mother, Sharon's first wife, had already died in a car crash in 1962. Sharon was now overcome with grief. His troops mourned his loss with him. Then it was back to business. Sharon was deputed to clamp down on the Gaza Strip in 1971, pursuing PLO guerrillas, seven or eight hundred of them, and as ever, he punched hard. In the 70s, we were in Nakhal Aza. In 1970, we sat near Gaza and he said to me, Eli, I will put an end to terror in Gaza. I said to him, Eric, I read all the books on terrorism and I never read that anyone has ever managed to end terrorism by force. He said to me, come back in three or four months and see for yourself. Sharon tamed Gaza with, as he put it, goodwill and humane values. But Palestinian militants were killed and arrested. Thousands of houses demolished, roads driven ruthlessly through the refugee camps. He was dubbed the bulldozer. He was a senior commander going with the units from house to house, from bunker to bunker, from orange grove to orange grove, to explain what he meant. Three months later, Gaza was quiet. The terror was crushed with an iron fist, with a vicious hand. He cast fear in Gaza. He was feared. Feared in Gaza and unloved by his fellow generals, Sharon's maverick behavior led them to block his promotion, and the top job of chief of staff eluded him. He believed in his way, and it was very hard for him to accept his commander decision. Uh, he was a kind of troublemaker along, along the years. Do you believe order should always be obeyed? I believe that order should be obeyed. But sometimes you come to a situation where you have to think about the orders that you get. To whom should you be loyal or more loyal? To your troops or to your superiors? And I must tell you that in many times, I believe you must be more loyal to your troops than to your superiors. Ogi Eli, Ogi Eli. Ogi, Eli, 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 Ogi, Ogi. Sharon, at 45, was shunted into the Army Reserve. The land, though, was in his blood. When you know every hill and wadi and orchard, he wrote later, when your family is there, that is when you have power. He bought a big farm in southern Israel with his second wife, Lily, a turning point in his life. The soldier farmer moved into politics, typically doing it with a bang, creating a new center-right party coalition called Likud, Unity, and teaming up with Menachem Begin, the future prime minister. He had considerable uh, impact on Israeli politics by establishing the Likud, because until he established the Likud, Israel was dominated by the Labour Party and by the Labour Movement. By uh, creating the Likud, he offered the Israeli uh, audience an alternative, a political alternative, and, and because of that, really, we started the period when the government were changed. The Suez Canal was Sharon's prescient location for his first party political broadcast. <laughs> It was autumn 1973. Israeli troops shared his complacency. 
وعشنا عمل هون وعنا موجودين على شان يضرب الاسرائيلي ليش؟ On Yom Kippur, Judaism's most sacred holiday, Egypt and Syria attacked. They caught the Israelis napping. When the war started, about 2,000 Egyptian artillery guns opened fire. Dozens of aircraft were bombing us. So all the Sinai Desert was shaking. It was unbelievable. Most of my brigade were either injured or killed. And then Arik Sharon came as a kind of reinforcement units, and immediately he gave us uh, the feeling that we will be able eventually to win the, the war. He was quiet, precise, determined, and very human and very kind, because he, he knew by then that we went through hell until the reserve unit came. Sharon at his battlefield best, but even here, his wife and two boys remained an inspiration, as Gayula Cohen discovered during the war while she was staying with Lily. One day, she answered the phone, and all of a sudden I hear her singing, so I, 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 I couldn't understand. I knew that she is talking to him in the middle of the war, and what a war. And she's singing a very lyrical song. And uh, she told me that it, it's like for him the ammunition, for this is his weapon, the lyrical song. For me, it was to know the man again and again, to love him more and more, and to believe that we must win. With such songs, with such commanders, we will win. Sharon was at loggerheads as ever with fellow generals, but it was his historic crossing of the Suez Canal that won the 1973 war on the Egyptian front. The bridges were not ready yet. And Arik Sharon took a very brave decision to start the operation, knowing that during the coming hours, everything will be settled. And it was very risky. <laughs> Because of Arik Sharon's leadership, we continue to cross the Suez Canal and to fight. And I think that the people of Israel owe a lot to Arik Sharon. Investigated later and acquitted of the charge of disobeying orders, he was hailed as the Israeli hero of the Yom Kippur War. Arik, King of Israel, was the popular cry. Your now famous canal crossing in October has been variously described as a brilliant maneuver and military madness. Which description is true? I'm afraid uh, both are true <laughs> because uh, without uh, madness, I don't believe that anybody would have done it. To believe that you can do it during one night, a certain element of madness should be there. Did you believe But you I will call it a positive madness. After the Yom Kippur War, he published a call to his soldiers in which he more or less blamed the government for what we then perceived, or what then Israel perceived as a disaster of the war, the surprise of the war. And in, in the call he said, now I'm going back to the civilian arena and I expect that you will follow me there as well. Now in Israeli uh, terms of uh, what is right and what is wrong involving politics in the army, it was a scandal. He used very deliberately his reputation as a military hero to gain political benefits. Israel's 1977 election was a crossroads for the land, ending almost 30 years of Labour Party rule. 
relatively liberal Zionism gave way to right-wing nationalism. Sharon became Minister of Agriculture, with Menachem Begin as the new Prime Minister. What occupied territories? If you mean Judea, Samaria and the Gaza Strip, they are liberated territories. They are part, an integral part, of the land of Israel. Populating these territories with Jewish settlements became a priority. Sharon was the godfather of settlement, turning tented outposts into small towns with a consistent policy of expansion. Sharon also saw this in military terms as a security issue, but the dream was of a greater Israel that Messianic Zionists believed was theirs. His greatest achievement is to settle the historical places of the people of Israel after the Six Day War. He was the one who who changed our map. This is the map, the road maps of uh, historical road map of us. And I'm sure that we will it will stay this way or other way. You can't you can't change it anymore. And this was Sharon's message. All of it. Gaza included. The essence of everything in the eyes of Sharon and people like him is the war between Israel and the Arabs. This is the beginning and the end of everything. The war is given. It's a fact which it cannot end. There never will be peace. The Arabs will never accept us. Now, the settlement effort is the weapon of war. The bulldozer is more effective in the end than the tank. The tank conquers territory, but to hold the territory, you need the bulldozer. You have to change the landscape and turn the Arab landscape into a Jewish landscape. The pioneer settlers called themselves Gush Emunim, Block of the Faithful. Most, unlike Sharon, were religiously motivated. But with government help, secular Jews were to join them, and Sharon was their patron. They had the spark, and he took this spark and turned it to a, a, a very, very great fire. And there is no one settlement in Judea and Samara that his fingerprints are not in. Sharon the soldier, eyeing the narrowness of Israel between the West Bank and the Mediterranean, explained to me why settlement was a matter of security, but also of Zionist import. We had a problem here, how to keep in our hands the high, important, strategic terrain which were overlooking the coastal plain. How to keep it in our hands and how to prevent it in the future when we'll come to any kind of political solution from having it in the hands of anybody else. Yet it was Sharon who supervised the destruction of the Amit settlement in Sinai in 1982, following a peace agreement with Egypt, an odd pre-echo of Gaza 23 years later. How did the godfather of settlement justify his change of heart? Sharon managed to dismantle Amit because Sharon had no ideology whatever in any, in any subject. And when he decided or got the approval to dismantle it, he had no big problem to dismantle it emotionally or psychologically because, according to my view, he was a very pragmatic person and even opportunistic person. And that's the key to understand him. This was the period that I didn't speak to him for years after Yamit, till he, uh, it was uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago that he said, I, pay, I, I regret what I did. It was a mistake and never I'll repeat it again. <laughs> never repeat it again. Sharon had become defense minister in 1981, a real prize given his failure to become chief of staff. His real aim in life was to become minister of defense. Begin did not want to give him the job. He gave it to Ezra Weizmann. Begin was afraid of Sharon. He once said in a, jokingly, 
that if uh, Sharon becomes Minister of Defense, he surrounds the Knesset with his tanks. It was a joke, but a telling joke. And, but uh, four years later, in 81, uh, he had no choice. Weizmann was there, they had no valid reason to, to prevent Sharon, the famous general, the victorious general, from assuming this post, and he became Minister of Defense. אתם מקבלים כשר הביטחון את אחד הלוחמים, המפקדים והמצביעים המהוללים ביותר בתולדות ישראל, סבא. אני בטוח שבתפקידו כשר הביטחון יוכיח את כל יכולתו. Power at last for Sharon. But as Alexander Haig, the U.S. Secretary of State, was to discover when he met him in Washington, still a member of the awkward squad. His first greeting to me was to pound the table uh, very, very noisily and say, when are you going to start to treat us as an ally? Uh, I replied and mimicked him and pounded the table equally hard and said, when you begin acting like an ally. So that began the conference. <laughs> Sharon's next adventure was the invasion of Lebanon against the PLO leader Yasser Arafat, who was Beirut-based and controlling the militant groups who fired rockets from Lebanon into Israel. Sharon saw his opportunity after a particularly heavy rocketing of Galilee. Israel's main ally, the United States, was dismayed. Their worry was the risk of provoking Syria whose army had been deployed in Lebanon for the past six years. I wanted to really impress him with the dangers that he was uh, toying with. And I told him in no uncertain terms that this is not going to be anything that would be taken lightly, reiterating our policy and warning against the conflict. Israeli tanks were only supposed to clear Palestinian guerrillas out of the Lebanese border zone. But Sharon had a grander scheme, a drive all the way to Beirut. Not quite what he told his cabinet colleagues. When the decision was taken to invade Lebanon, he spoke of occupying 40 kilometers. And then on the second day of the war, I began to realize that really he's trying to push the army further on and that he's using all sorts of in order to explain it and create the impression that it's only for a short, for a very short uh, distance. And on the third day, I realized that he was deceiving us, that actually he has in mind something entirely different. Who thought that the government, even for a moment, gave the government to the people from the border to the 45 kilometers? He's wrong. The government has never given the government למחבלים משום מקום בעולם, ולא תיתן חסינות למחבלים בשום מקום אחר בעולם. The result was, of course, that one kilometer was added to another, and in, 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 in the course of time, he reached Beirut. But several cabinet ministers have said publicly in Israel that you deceived them, that you implied that you were only going to go 25 miles and went to Beirut. I never deceived any one of them. And uh, every step that was taken in Lebanon was as a result of a cabinet meeting or a cabinet resolution. Every step. Beirut was besieged in a three-month campaign with Sharon improvising daily, informing his cabinet colleagues bit by bit. The man himself turned up to view the scene. The campaign was brutal, killing at least 15,000 civilians. I suppose that one would have to say that, from an Israeli point of view, what they did was justified. They did it a little heavy-handedly uh, from the American point of view, and they managed to split the administration uh, in Washington, the Reagan administration, right down the middle. <laughs> Under an American brokered agreement, some 10,000 of Yasser Arafat's guerrillas quit the Lebanon. For Sharon, a tactical success. 
But his larger strategy for redesigning the Middle East was a failure. Arafat himself, though, was forced to board ship and flee the land. Sharon failed in particular in one uh, of his key ambitions. He believed that by driving the PLO out of Lebanon, he would defeat Palestinian nationalism at the root, and of course that was nonsense. And it uh, became evident as nonsense when the first intifada or uprising broke out in the occupied territories in late 1987. And he didn't realize that he created a vacuum in which a much worse element came into power in Lebanon. And instead of the PLO, we got the Hezbollah, which hardly existed before the Lebanese war. And so he was really the father of the Hezbollah. Worse was to follow. Sharon let his Lebanese Christian allies into the Beirut refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila. Putting the phalanges to uh, professional murderers who already had a long record of atrocities in Palestinian refugee camps, putting them into Sabra and Shatila, you knew what the outcome is. I once said you, you, you put a snake into the uh, cradle of a, of a baby, a poisonous snake, you don't have to prove that you wanted to kill the baby. Sharon's troops lit the sky with their flares to help the phalangists. Inside the camps, the phalangists butchered hundreds of Palestinians and their families. Israeli forces did nothing to stop them. The world was appalled. It remains one very dark chapter uh, for which Sharon was responsible and he uh, will be held responsible for throughout history. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't responsible for an ongoing, systematic, incremental policy of bloodshed and of violence and militarism and oppression. Many Israelis too were horrified. Some 400,000 of them took to the streets in the biggest demonstration the country had seen. This was the humane voice of Israel talking. Sharon's name was immutably sullied, and with Israel's cabinet also against him, he was to be sacked as defense minister. This is Kol Yisrael. Hard to sit by the report is Defense Minister Ariel Sharon. The commission declares that Sharon bears personal responsibility and recommends that he resign. Well, of course, of course, he uh, deceived the prime minister, and the prime minister realized it at the end, and that affected him and, and sent him into a depression, where he retired from public life, and very soon after that he died. Sharon himself retreated once again with his wife Lily to the farm. Surprisingly, despite Sabra and Shatila, he survived politically, no longer defense minister, but still in the cabinet. He felt betrayed, though, by his colleagues' acceptance of that damning Kahan Commission report. I'm the only minister of defense in the world, the only one, who left his post and went back to work on a tractor on his farm as a result of what Christians did to Muslims. The only one. But the time he spent with Lily, he later wrote, was more healing than anything else could possibly be. For her, Arik was God. I mean, I very seldom seen such a adoration. And um, it was very moving, actually. And he was, he was great to her. I mean, it wasn't a one-sided thing. His family and his land was his strength and his shelter. 
um, I remember him telling me telling once that his strength does not come from any uh, uh, political apparatus of, of, of any kind. It comes from the land and it comes from the family. That's why it was important for him. I think it, it's also important with Sharon to realize that he's not an entirely rational man. There's this love of the land, this love of classical music. Very, very powerful emotions at work. A deep, deep attachment to uh, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, a belief that uh, Israel has to stand on its own, a contempt for outsiders, and this sort of drive that Israel had to do it on her own. Many Israelis supported him. There were demonstrations against him, but also those in his favor. Just as Israel itself has been so often divided, so was the public attitude to Sharon. He drove his tractor, but his political career was far from being ruined. He was still in the cabinet and continued officially to fund Jewish settlement in the occupied lands, whilst campaigning for more Jewish immigration to Israel. Out of sight quite often, like Yasser Arafat, but never out of mind. Arafat himself returned in 1994 to the Gaza Strip. It was a time of hope, but the Oslo peace accords of a Labour government, which began a dialogue with Arafat and the Palestinians. Sharon, though, had opposed Oslo from the beginning. A somewhat inflammatory speech, little did he realize that a month later, Israel's Labour Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was to be murdered by a Jewish religious zealot for pursuing peace. Likud returned to power. Sharon was back as Minister of National Infrastructure. It didn't last. In this yo-yo of Israeli power, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu also came and went. Neither he nor Sharon favoured dialogue with the Palestinians. At Camp David in America, though, Netanyahu's Labour successor, Ehud Barak, did make a bid for peace with Arafat, but the bid collapsed with President Clinton blaming the Palestinians. Sharon was out of government, but not out of the headlines. In September 2000, he paid a politically charged visit to the Noble Sanctuary, the third holiest site in Islam. Things quickly turned sour. Shortly after, another Palestinian uprising started, the Second Intifada. There was no provocation here. The provocation was only on the other side. Sharon's visit to Al-Aqsa Mosque was deliberately designed to provoke the Palestinians to unleash a whole new cycle of violence. We knew then that the situation was extremely volatile, and we said this at that time to Ehud Barak. When he went to the Temple of Mount, it was a totally cynical move, no question about it. He didn't go, he didn't go there because of religious motivation. Sharon wasn't a religious person. It was a totally cynical political movement to embarrass Ehud Barak government. And it succeeded. There's no question that the Intifada uh, brought Barak down, um, that violence helped elect Sharon. But I don't think it's accurate to say that Sharon calculated that his visit to the Temple Mount would spark a violent response which would then get him into office. Uh, that, that is simply a misreading of history. He was like a lightning rod. He, he always managed to attract and to create situations of vol volatility and extreme violence. 
Away from politics, Sharon's private life had been dealt a tragic blow. His beloved wife, Lily, died from cancer, a loss that he felt keenly. From now on, he would have to face the world on his own. Five months later, by now the Likud party leader, he fought a formidable election campaign. His party's spin doctors played him up as Sharon, the cuddly family man. His luck was as a politician. First of all, he's an excellent politician. So that's one reason why he was successful in politics. He was a born politician, not a statesman. He's the opposite of a statesman, but he was a born politician, very cunning. And he knows how to present his views in a way that deceives the public. If he was able to deceive Menachem Begin, who was a shrewd politician, where's the surprise in the fact that he deceived the public? Escalating Palestinian violence played into Sharon's hands as Labour's Prime Minister faltered. Iraq, in the face of the violence, continued to make concessions to Arafat that the Israeli people just rejected that notion that, that they would give more under fire. They were very angry and about it and they wanted a tough response. And Sharon represented, he was in effect the epitome of the tough response. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon had won the election hands down to get Kibia, the Mittler Pass and Lebanon in their fear and anger, Israelis had turned to their trusty bulldozer for Likud, a time of rejoicing. The day after his election win, he'd visited the Western Wall, adjoining the Al-Aqsa Mosque, where he'd caused such a rumpus the previous year. And I'll bring peace to the citizens of Israel and, and stability to the Middle East. But when violence flared, Sharon favoured the Iron Fist, particularly in the occupied territories. And Palestinian militants played brutally into his hands. A suicide bomber at the Dolphinarium nightclub in Tel Aviv, not long after his election, killed 19 teenagers and injured 120. Chairman Arafat is an enemy because he decided about strategy of terror and formed a coalition of terror. Sharon's election year ended with tanks moving in on Arafat's headquarters in the West Bank. Ceasefires had come and gone. The Israeli Prime Minister unleashed waves of assaults against the Palestinian leader, besieged in his offices amid the ruins. I am uh, appealing to the whole international world to stop this aggression. He tried to uh, exclude Arafat from the political arena, how he described him as being irrelevant. We saw how he surrounded him physically. We saw how he blew up the headquarters, the Mokata. We saw the relentless bombing and shelling. There was a deep, visceral loathing of Arafat, which went far beyond the rational. I remember the chief of Israeli military intelligence uh, sort of raising his eyebrows when uh, uh, Sharon was going on about Arafat. Uh, you know, even uh, his courtiers found sometimes uh, Sharon's obsession with Arafat to be uh, beyond what was justified. His actions not only ended the political era in Palestinian life, but ended also the chances of peace for a long time. I remember the day that there was uh, the terror attack in the Pat Junction in Jerusalem, and I spoke with the Prime Minister at 7.15 when it happened. I said, I'm going there. And it took me three seconds to understand there's no way to convince him not to go there. I went there with him, we walked out of the car, a meter and a half from a bus that exploded, and on the bus there were two, uh, um, dead, two dead girls, decapitated and naked because the fire burned their clothes. And then we were walking and passing the 24 body bags that were lying on the ground, and this was his responsibility. He was the prime minister of those people. It was his responsibility what happened. 
it was his responsibility to make sure it never happens again. It happened time and time and time again. I saw his frustration at uh, his inability to control Palestinian violence, his uh, resort to the reaction really he'd had in the 1950s of believing that the only way to deal with Palestinian violence was to kill 10 Arabs for every Jew who was killed. I remember being with him once when the news of a, an attack came in outside the settlement of Emmanuel in the northern West Bank and seeing him react with cold, irrational fury, uh, picking up the phone to his defence minister, Fuad Ben Eliezer, and ordering retaliation without any real thought of the consequences, just this basic primeval instinct that uh, violence has to be reacted to with violence and uh, several eyes for every uh, Jewish eye that had been taken. Sharon ordered an Israeli assault on the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank in April 2002, a response to suicide bombings. More than 50 Palestinians were killed, almost half of them civilians, and more than 20 Israeli troops. He thought that terrorists should be fought as long as there's no one from the Palestinian Authority who is doing what he should do and fight terrorists. The terrorists should be fought by Israel, and in the same time, in a parallel route, peace process or any accord should be moved forward, and that's what he did. Then came this security barrier built to separate Israelis from the West Bank. Initially, Sharon was slow to support the barrier, concerned it would be seen as a ruse to expropriate more Palestinian land. He was afraid that the barrier will be a political barrier. And I told him it should be a security barrier, but it should be built. And it took a few months until he was convinced. And once he was convinced, he behaved as if it's his own idea. And that was the real Sharon. When he understood professionally that we need a barrier, he was behind the barrier. And when he was behind something, it's, it was a bulldozer. With Sharon as boss, the levels of violence on both sides remained high. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, wheelchair-bound, quadriplegic and half-blind, was victim of one of Sharon's so-called targeted killings. Yassin was spiritual leader of the militant group Hamas, which promoted suicide bombings. A martyr was created. Targeted killings, targeted assassinations, were the most controversial part of Israel's response to the Palestinian terrorism. But after 9-11, the United States engaged in targeted assassinations. And so therefore, there was no ability anymore, no willingness to criticize Israel. President Bush was Sharon's crucial ally. They had a strong rapport, and Bush backed him to the hilt. George Bush evidently was the person who had come closest to uh, Sharon's worldview, uh, his ideological outlook, but most importantly, the person who gave to Sharon what other prime ministers of Israel had not been able to get, American acceptance that Israel should keep settlements it had taken by force in the occupied territories and to annex them to Israel before the final peace deal with the Palestinians was done. Sharon uh, was extremely skillful in feeding Bush's White House the information uh, he thought uh, they needed, the so-called intelligence he thought they needed to get them to take a particular view on a particular issue at a particular time. And his two coups were really uh, persuading Bush uh, that Arafat was a liar, something we all knew, and that Bush thereafter refused to deal with Arafat, and then uh, persuading Bush to endorse uh, more or less uh, Sharon's vision of uh, uh, withdrawal from Gaza. The Gaza Strip was one of the most densely populated places in the world, packed with poverty-stricken Palestinians. Sharon, the man who had encouraged Jewish settlers, now said they needed to leave. Sharon made clear over and over again 
that the Gaza disengagement was consistent with the roadmap, would lead to the roadmap, and he much preferred a unilateral disengagement from Gaza, which would enable him, he thought, to define the territory that Israel could keep in the West Bank. He didn't want a Palestinian partner for this process because it would have meant that he would have had to give up more than he was prepared to agree to in the West Bank. For Sharon, Yasser Arafat remained a problem until, that is, he went abroad for hospital treatment and died. His departure was presented as clearing the way for political discussion. Sharon pressed on with his plan for Gaza. In all my years of service, I have made hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions, many in regard to life and death. But the decision about the disengagement plan is the most difficult of all. Sharon's new Gaza policy got him into serious hot water, not just with settlers, but with his own party. They booed him. Many hated the very notion of even a truncated Palestinian state. But he was always against his party. When his party was not willing to hear about a Palestinian state, he came during pre-elections and said, well, you know, this is a fact. There will be a Palestinian state next to Israel. And he was criticized by key members in his party. When he said that, well, you know, we believed in greater Israel, but this is something that, looking towards the future, is not possible anymore, and I'm redeploying unilaterally from the Gaza Strip, he lost the referendum. The party was something that he always knew to put aside. There was Israel, and there was the party, and Israel was more important than the party. For Israel's settlers, the Gaza withdrawal was a nightmare. For them, it was part of the land of Israel. The pullout was largely peaceful, though some settlers had to be physically removed. As for Sharon's motives, the views differ. The debate, I feel, about um, whether Sharon uh, had changed his spots, uh, had changed hearts, uh, finally, and that he was giving up Gaza or other uh, land uh, because he fundamentally changed heart about making peace with the Arabs and the Palestinians, I think is nonsense. He's someone who didn't believe that a permanent peace with the Palestinians was possible or would not be possible for 40 or 50 years to come. And the only issue was simply whether he was going to be confronted with enough American and international pressure to make the deal that had to be made to achieve real peace with the Palestinians or not. The withdrawal from Gaza was very blunt. Rather than doing it in, a, in the context of an agreement with the Palestinians, he was ready to give it for free to the Hamas because he did not believe that there was any difference between Hamas and the, the PLO or Fatah. They were all, all Arabs. As for Likud, his rebellious party, Sharon simply dumped it, leaving it shrunken and enfeebled. Sharon founded a new party, Kadima, taking many Likud ministers with him. Kadima, a hot favorite for the next elections. But then, at the beginning of 2006, Sharon once more shocked the world. He suffered a major stroke. He would remain in a coma till his death. Ehud Olmert, his Kadima brother-in-arms and a former mayor of Jerusalem, took over. Sharon's image dominated the election, underwriting Olmert's campaign. Kadima won. Likud collapsed. The old general, even in his absence, had won another victory. But as Sharon lay incapacitated in hospital, his vision of a path to peace began to fall apart. Israel was drawn into a brutal new war in Lebanon. Over a thousand Lebanese and 165 Israelis were killed. In Gaza, the militant Palestinian group Hamas had taken power and Israel had blockaded the Strip. 
Volleys of Katusha rockets were repeatedly fired on Israeli towns close to the border. Israel hit back, pounding Gaza for three weeks. Over a thousand Palestinians and 13 Israelis were killed. Sharon's disengagement policy had not delivered the security it promised. Regardless of what he did politically, his legacy is one that made uh, violence and uh, a bloody resolution of issues the uh, modus operandi uh, in Palestine, against the Palestinians. Now, Sharon's new party, Kadima, has collapsed, replaced in power by a coalition run by his old party, Likud. Prime Minister Netanyahu has shown little interest in talking to the Palestinians. The settlements have continued to expand. The Americans are trying to revitalize talks, but peace in the Middle East seems as elusive as ever. And for many, this is Sharon's legacy. He wasted our time. We could have done so much about occupation, about settlements, about peace. He was an obstacle to these things. And it's sad because he had the capacity to lead and he led the country in the wrong direction. He uh, did not believe in diplomacy. He really believed that Israel could uh, live in a, uh, on an island, uh, detached from the world, detached from the Middle East. He was center stage in all the main events of Israel's bloody story, and his place in its history is secure. If he would have stopped one day to, uh, to, to ask himself, what do you want history to say about you? I think, if I can imagine, he would have said, a strong leader, but a leader for peace. The fact of the matter is, he broke the mold. No other prime minister was prepared to take on the settler movement. Yitzhak Rabin gave up his life because he antagonized the settlers. And Sharon not only had the courage, but he had the political capability to do that. And I think in many ways, in terms of his contribution to peace, that will be his lasting legacy. That he made it legitimate in the Israeli political life for settlements to be evacuated. Loved and loathed in equal measure, Sharon was a formidable man who lived by the sword. For many in Israel, he is a hero beyond criticism. For others, his legacy will forever be tainted by the destruction he left in his wake. <laughs>